to Psalm 59. Psalm 59 is where we're going to be this morning. It's on page 477 of your chair Bibles. And as you turn there, would you remain standing for the reading of God's Word, beginning in the heading of Psalm chapter 59. To the choir master, according to Do Not Destroy, a victim of David, when Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord, for no fault of mine, they run and make ready. Awake, come to meet me and see. You, Lord God of hosts, are God of Israel. Rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. Selah. Each evening they come back, howling like dogs and prowling about the city. There they are, bellowing with their mouths, with swords in their lips, for who they think will hear us. But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You hold all the nations in derision. O oh, my strength, I will watch for you, for you, O God, are my fortress. My God, in his steadfast love, will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Kill them not, lest my people forget. Make them totter by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouths, the words of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride. For the cursing and lies that they utter, consume them in wrath, consume them till they are no more, that they may know that God rules over Jacob to the ends of the earth, Selah. Each evening they come back, howling like dogs and prowling about the city, they wander about for food and growl if they do not get their fill. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning, for, for you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you, for you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to your word. Lord, would you speak to us through your scripture? God, would you minimize distractions in our lives? Would you bring distress to the forefront, Father? And Lord, would you bring your faithfulness to the forefront of our minds and our hearts today? God, would you be glorified in this time? And will we live differently because of it? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In your day of distress, what do you do? When all seems lost, when, when the circumstances get so bad, where do you turn? Now, I don't want you to immediately call to mind the ways you should respond or the ways that you might respond or the ways you would respond. I want you to ponder for a moment in your day of distress, how have you responded? Here in the 59th Psalm, we, we see the worst of circumstances and an, un, and an unbelievable response. And I would argue that most of us in this room, we don't have a category for, for this type of existence, for what's taking place here. I would argue we could, we could probably navigate our way through regurgitating promises of God, but when it comes to their functional application and what it looks like to confidently depend on those promises, we live so far from being hunted that the fervent, God-honoring Christian language that we see here is, is almost foreign to us. But we're quick. We are quick to recall David's status as king. We're quick to recall God's favor towards David. But we have spiritual amnesia when it comes to the road that David traveled. We are so insulated from any sense of peril, we believe ourselves experts at solving our own tiny problems. Is this not true? In our day of distress, we get to work minimizing our distress. And yet here sits the Psalm 59. 
beginning in the heading to the choir master, according to Do Not Destroy, a victim of David, when Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. The circumstances surrounding this psalm today are, are dire. They, they find their inspiration in 1 Samuel 19. So just to give you some context, Saul is the current king of Israel, and he is consumed with hatred for the future king David. And we see it illustrated in 1 Samuel 19, 8 through 11. A few of their psalms come from this chapter. And I'll read in verse 8. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow so that they have fled before him. There's our mighty man of God, David. Verse 9, then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. There's blood in his heart. And David was playing the liar. He wants to kill him. Verse 10, and Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul so that he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. There's attempted murder number one. Then we get to verse 11. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him that he might kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. David is the one day promised king of Israel and he is on the run from the current king, Saul. So Saul is driven by pride and jealousy, so much so he is willing to use the entire might of the kingdom's resources to accomplish the murder of one person. But before we move on, we we cannot escape the fact that it is God who has sovereignly allowed for distress to be set into motion. For his own glory, God orchestrated an opportunity for David to be taught dependence and submission. And in Psalm 59, we see it modeled. The sovereignty of God and the submission of his servant. That's what we have on full display here. God's complete control and David's dependent devotion. So we can't miss that David's deliverance here, it's the work of the Psalms' main character, the Lord God. So here's your main idea for the day. Main idea is this. In the day of distress, the Lord God is the strength of his people. So what do we glean from this? What can we learn? In the day of distress, the Lord God is the strength of his people. When God is our strength, we depend on him for deliverance. Let's look at what David says in verse 1. He says, deliver me from my enemies. Oh my God, protect me from those who rise up against me. The order of the complaint or petition illustrates what's most urgent here. We've seen that in earlier messages. And David, with his life on the line, deliverance is most urgent. We will read in a moment of the complaint further in God's steadfast love, but David is being hunted and his outlook is dark. Think here, think capital punishment. His execution has been ordered. He, he's bound and the only thing standing between him and death is not whether the oppressor will strike. <clears throat> it's not whether the oppressor will strike, but it is when the oppressor will strike. If you look further to verse two, he says, deliver me, protect me, deliver me save me. This is fervent pleading in the face of certain death. And and we could camp here all day long. But what we get to see from David is that in the face of a very real, time-sensitive, and tangible threat, where does he go? He goes to God believing in his very real presence and his very tangible ability to meet his need. And his dependence is twofold. He cries for help, And he admits that he cannot deliver himself. Verse 2, deliver me from those who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. One commentator says that in the face of such a threat, unbelief, unbelief would say that this prayer is a waste of breath and yet it is the sole resort for David. And what is he doing here? He's characterizing the appetite of the enemy over and against his own desire for the Lord. That's why he calls them, he calls them bloodthirsty men. I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. If you would please turn to Paul's letter to the Philippian church. 
In Philippians chapter 3, the first few verses, Paul is is walking them through what it means to to strive forward to the upward call of God that is in Christ Jesus and forget what lies behind. And as he's saying, be imitators of me, walk as those who are upright. As he's saying that, he then provides an illustration of those who, who are not doing that, those whose appetites are other than, for other than God. And he illustrates this appetite in Philippians chapter three, verses 18 and 19. He says, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Verse 19, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Their minds, their souls, all their strength, their hearts, He's illustrating that they are attracted solely to what they desire most in the moment. Their God is their belly. Their aim in their life is to satisfy the most recent craving. And for these people that are chasing after David, that craving is for blood. And what makes this even worse? These men were instruments of King Saul. One that should be just in his dealings and he should be righteous in the way that he rules this kingdom. That's what he's been called to. He's engaging David with the power that God has given him to work evil. And man, was his power seemingly extensive. He had undying loyalty from those that he commanded. And I think this is the kicker. This this might might be what caused David the most distress. King Saul could validate anything that he did. At least in this instance and for this moment, Because it was a decree from the king, Saul could call this action just when it was not just. And this led David to say in verse 3, For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. And he says, For no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord. For no fault of mine. They run and they make ready. His situation, it's doubly troubling because in, in the court of law, he's, he's not going to make it out even if we look at the evidence because it's stacked against him. It's not just anyone that's coming after him. It's the one that has dominion over the, this earthly kingdom. And I think you could see with all of the evidences piling up how he could say, I, I might, you, you wouldn't blame him for saying, I might not make it, I might not make it out of this. And in this instance, what could David articulate? He could articulate his innocence in regard to him being hunted. Now, we know David. We know the David of this Bible. He is far from being ultimately innocent. But in regard to being on death row and hunted, David could go to the Lord in confidence and articulate that this is unjust behavior. And then he would cry in the second half of verse 4, Awake, come to meet me and see He's saying, come to me now. And now now we often think when we see the the quick nature of our ruin or how quickly something terrible could happen or how fast the circumstances of demise will come upon us, we often use that as an excuse to then bypass depending on God, don't we? And I've seen what this immediate dependence looks like, what, what David's trying to illustrate here. And in my three children. I've got a, a three toddlers, and they love the idea of dogs. They adore them when they're over there. But if they start to make their way towards us, even if they're happy or they're moving with aggression, it doesn't matter. It becomes a dire situation for my children. Now, what do you think they do? Do you think that they start scanning the horizon for high ground? Maybe doing a little bit of calculus as to wondering maybe, well, my foot speed, that's a two-year-old dog, I might be able to get around a corner, might be able to grab something heavy. They start doing this, how do I deliver myself in this moment? No, my, my toddlers, they cry out and they position themselves behind dad. Why? Because I am dad and I am near. I'm not saying that I'll win every fight with every dog that comes close to my children. The the point here, the point that we need to see is that the urgency of David's predicament, it didn't deter him from crying to the Father 
that is near. He went to the only location that he could receive help. What an indictment for us today. When we are faced with very real, time-sensitive and tangible threats, we, do we not so often look for high ground? We calculate how to respond, and we look to tangibly meet our own need. When in fact, the proper response is to cry for deliverance and position oneself behind the Father. He goes to verse five. He says, you, Lord God of hosts, by appealing to who he is, you, Lord God of hosts, are God of Israel. Rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. Selah. What does David know? He knows that God's appetite for his own glory is greater than the bloodthirstiness of the men. For David, he knows who he's petitioning. He's, he's calling upon the promise maker and the promise keeper. This isn't just David's God, it's Israel's God. He he is appealing to the creator on behalf of the covenants that not just him, but all who find themselves in like situation, they can go to him and trust that he will deliver. And we must pause here. As a people who look to fix their own problems, we need to be taught what dependence on God looks like. And when God is our strength, we depend on God for deliverance because he is the only one up to the task. At the same time, David is petitioning the Lord for deliverance. He is equally making the statement, I am not sufficient to deliver myself. We've got to take it a step farther. I'm not not sufficient to deliver myself. We can't be trusted to deliver ourselves. And it's this reality that gives David to then, in confidence, petition the Father for their demise. It shows, shows us this, when God is our strength, We are confident in victory. When God is our strength, we are confident in victory. Not that we can be, but we are confident in victory. David illustrates the nature of his oppressors in verses six and seven. He says, each evening they come back howling like dogs, prowling about the city. There they are bellowing with their mouths, with with swords in their lips for who they think will hear us. Not just in deed, not not just the task they've been called to, but in their speech, these are corrupted people. It's this thought that led Jesus to speak to the religious folk in Matthew 12, verses 34 to 37. He would say, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, The heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. In case you didn't think he was serious, verse 36, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Not only does God hear the speech of the enemy, He's acquainted with the states of their hearts and those hearts are set against him. That's why he then can say in verse eight, but you, O Lord, laugh at them. You hold all the nations in derision. God hears the rebellion. They say, who will hear us? God hears. Not only does he hear, he is present to meet them in rebellion. It isn't just anyone that this group of people has sinned against. It's the God of the universe, the one that set the world into motion, who who tells the oceans where to stop, who who forms us in our mother's wombs and who upholds everything by the word of his power. That's who's being sinned against here. And as a due reward for their hatred, God holds them in confusion. The nations who are set against the people of God will answer to God. One commentator points out, I love this, He laughs with scorn at their pretensions of power, their prideful assumption of power. He says God is unconcerned with their vicious attack, not in the sense that he does not care about the harm they may do, but in the same sense that their action in no way hinders or damages his own purposes. God is still sovereignly in control even in the midst of this distress. And that is why David can then say in verse 9, my strength. He's been, called a, he's been called a fortress, will be called a fortress, a, a place to hide free from harm. He's been, he's been called a refuge. 
which is a, a habitation for rehabilitation and, and safety. He's been called a shield, is when you, when you go to battle, the thing that will protect you from the darts of the enemy. And here he's called strength. It's not just the God that surrounds David, but the God that preserves David. In the face of certain death, he's not just sure that he will, that he will escape ultimate harm. He is sure that he will thrive I think there's a reason this sits in verse 9 in this psalm directly in the middle. He says, oh, my strength, I will watch for you. For you, oh God, are my fortress. My God and his steadfast love will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Where his enemies are met with laughter, David is met with steadfast love. And what was a perilous situation for him lasts but a moment, but is sure forever for the enemy. What is a day of distress for the people of God is an eternity of stress for those that are set against him. And then he shifts his tone. He almost seems to contradict himself here, but he, he doesn't. He's been saying, consume them, consume them. He'll go in verse, th verse 13, say, consume them or, or make them fall. He moves this imprecatory psalm from personal to corporate. And he says in verse 11, kill them not lest my people forget. Make them totter by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. He says, kill them not. Don't forget the next part. Lest anyone forget. One quote says, like the starving dogs wandering the streets, seeking any scrap of food, the rejected enemies are not to be killed, but to live an agonizing public life of rejection and approbation. Whenever they're seen, they will spark a memory of their vicious sin and God's punishment. Their signs, their hollow eyes will offer the testimony to the abandonment of God and the loss of his blessings. The isolated sinner on the fringe of society will provide a cautionary warning to others not to follow their path. They are not to be considered powerful or be feared. They are to be seen as crushed, unsatisfied creatures living forgotten on the fringes of society. He can confidently say, kill them not, let them stand and he says, for the sin of their mouths in verse 12, the words of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride. For the cursing and lies that they utter, consume them in wrath, consume them till they are no more. And in case you didn't know the purpose of this entire word, and in case you didn't know the purpose of this, this psalm, why is this here? Why would he kill them not? He continues that they may know that God rules over Jacob to the ends of the earth, Selah. They stand as signs. It kind of calls back to mind Joshua's chapter 3 and 4. If you know when, when God dries up the Jordan and moves the people of God, he holds the water in a heap, moves the entire multitude of the people of God across the Jordan into the promised land, and he tells them to go down into the river, grab, grab these stones, pick them up, set them on the side. Why? So that when your children ask and your children's children ask, that they will know that there is a mighty God who is to be feared, who is greatly feared, and here, those that are enemies of God will serve the same purpose in the same way. Not a path to walk, but a path to not go towards. And so we must pause here to realize that God's ultimate deliverance of David is not a personal favor on God's behalf, but it is a standing testimony to who God is. And at the same time, the destruction of the enemy is a standing testimony to who God is not just for David, but for a people, that they may know that in distress, the glory of the Lord is what is priority, and God will not be denied his glory. His purposes will not be thwarted, and he will have his victory. That is why we can be confident in that victory. When God is our strength, we are confident in that victory. And David models not just confidence, not just dependence, but the natural end. When God is our strength, we praise him for steadfast love. Now, perhaps what served my soul the greatest in looking at what many wrote about this particular psalm, Charles Spurgeon says this. Here's where we start to get to us. Out of a sour, ungenerous soil spring up the honey-bearing flowers of psalmody. Had he never been cruelly hunted by Saul, Israel and the church of God, that's us, 
Israel and the church of God in after ages would have missed this song. The music of the sanctuary is in no small degree indebted to the trials of the saints. And praise is the appropriate conclusion of this imprecatory psalm. And he closes it by holding up two actions. Psalm 59, 14 says, Each evening they come back, howling like dogs and prowling about the city. They wander about for food and growl if they do not get their, their fill. In a conversation with a brother this past week talking about this, we get to see two pictures of eternity. We get to see what they will be doing for all of eternity if their hearts are not changed. They will be howling, prowling, and growling and not be filled for eternity. And th there will be those that are drowning in the love of the Lord. Call to mind, it says, their God is their belly and they will not be filled now, David doesn't have the end of the story. David doesn't know exactly. He doesn't get to read about it, but we do. Revelation 22, verses 12 to 16, we get to hear our Savior say, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter the city by the gates Here's the turn. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. And then Jesus. David didn't know his name, but Jesus knew his. And Jesus says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. And that is why he can say, blessed are those that are inside the gates and the dogs are outside. And that is why David can sing. That's what he's singing. That's the hope he's singing about. That's why in verse 16, he can say, I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. And David is singing even in the midst of his predicament. We oftentimes sing when it's over, depending on how it turned out. The psalm doesn't include the finished result of his distress. That's not what's modeled for us here, how to win well. Just that he sings one commentator notes, he, he's confident that, he's so confident that as he sings in the night, he's also going to be singing in the morning. That's what he knows. He says, for you have been to me a fortress, a refuge in the, my day of distress. Oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you. For you, oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows me steadfast love. Not just the one that protects the outside, but the one that sustains the inside. That's who I'm praising here. And so why does this sit here for us? Why Psalm 59? To help us ask this question for the church in after ages, how can this be a, a song for us? We must ask this question. In the day of distress, is God my strength? In the day of distress, is God my strength? The question may be explained further and may be read this way. In your day of distress, when things get so bad you don't know what to do, who's rousing to action? You? And some of you may sit here and say, well, I'm not really sure how to apply this one. I, I've got not that much distress in my life. I'm doing pretty good right now. Well, what we see modeled here is that there are those that, that sing of his steadfast love, aware of the distress that God can orchestrate, and then those that are unaware of it because they don't know him. Revelation 22:12. Again, he says, behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. It sounds like distress is coming, so is God your strength? It is for David, it's why he can praise God for his steadfast love. And why can he do this? Because without the steadfast love of the Lord, we are also gonna be laughed at. In our own power and will, left to our own devices, we are those that have an appetite for evil. And yet, in God's steadfast love and mercy, those who are his can praise him for his strength. Not just his protection, not just the tangible things that we pray for, but, but being strengthened from the inside. 
And David pins this psalm in the middle of the worst time in his life. And again, we know, inspired by God, we know that it sits here for us to ask this question. David pins this psalm understanding that God's people would need it, and we need it. Our enemy is active, and our mistake is believing that we're living in peacetime, that there's no distress, and that God is no longer concerned with our dependence. That's our mistake. Our own strength is laughable. What is our own strength against temptation? God would say to Cain in Genesis before he murdered his brother in Genesis 4, the Lord God said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. This idea that sin is crouching there waiting, carried forward all the way to Peter in 1 Peter 5, 8, knowing that there is very real distress around the corner. He says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Saul, drunk with jealousy and pride, just like Cain, would not allow sin to remain outside, but welcomed it in. And sin is living rent-free in their hearts. So what hope do we have? What hope did David have? David could look to the promises of God and trust in his future ultimate deliverance from his own sin, the true enemy. And we look to the provided promised Messiah for the exact same thing. Quote, one greater than David arose who was more innocent than David could ever claim to be, for whom enemies proud about seeking his life. David's enemies gathered together against the Lord and him, the Lord's anointed, just as they would gather against Yahweh and Jesus, the anointed. And God would laugh at them as well as they seek to kill the one who has life in himself. David was a servant of the Lord who suffered, but the true suffering servant, Jesus, is the one who would endure suffering to his death and by his death secure the deliverance of all of those who would call upon his name. In our day of distress, God's people can trust the work to deliver them has been accomplished. We can depend on him. In our day of distress, despite earthly hardship, we know that the ultimate victory has been won so we can be confident in that victory. And in our day of distress, with God as our strength, we can sing of his steadfast love to us. And this picture, in a great way, is shown to us, shown to us in Hebrews chapter 12. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 12 with me, verse 1 and 2, it sits just behind chapter 11, which is the famous hall of faith, which is beautiful to realize that there's a group of undeserving people from no merit of their own who, who understood the steadfast love of the Lord, who got to experience the steadfast love of the Lord sitting there in some way as stones for those to be remembered to, to look to. And in Hebrews chapter 12, it says that there's, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, the one who did it who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. On his day of distress, he despised the shame and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So our perseverance and endurance in hardship finds its power in our Savior's strength to go to the cross for our sins. That's why we can pray this song. That's why we can pray this imprecatory song because there was one who did it perfectly on our behalf and we do not pray it Without him within us, so is God your strength. For those whose strength is the Lord, their distress is but a light and momentary affliction. Therefore, this strongly worded psalm is a psalm of hope. It should have each one of us ask if God is our strength. And if God were to rouse himself today to meet you, would you be met with laughter or love? I pray that it is the latter. Let's pray together. Father God, every single one of us in this room can admit we are an undeserving people. Lord, a pe people in our own merit and our own action, unworthy of your presence. 
a people who originally are set against evil. And yet, Father, you sent your son. Lord, not just to protect, not just to surround, not just be the fortress or the refuge, Lord, but to be the strength within, to change dead hearts to ones that are made of flesh. So God, for us, the next time we are in distress, Lord, when we are in distress, Father, would we depend on you? Would we admit that we are not sufficient, Father? Would we be confident that you have the ultimate victory, that nothing can kill us? And then, Father, would we in right response sing of your steadfast love to us? Lord, from now until eternity, would that be our song in our day of distress? It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand together. And church, if your faith is in the Lord this morning, let's respond to this song.